Greetings. My message title this morning is Jesus is Life and Light. And it's uh, part of my series that we started last week that I'm calling, Who is Jesus? It, this all comes from uh, my trying to uh, cope with the message of Advent, which is uh, for this year, this season, was love and hope, and joy and peace. And then look at the world and uh, our nation and our world today, which is filled with uh, darkness and evil. Now, as I've said before uh, several times as we've sp uh, spoken about contemporary uh, developments in, in, in our nation, this is not a Democrat and Republican issue. Um, it's, it never has been. It's an issue between, uh, or a battle between good and evil, Satan and God. And that certainly crosses uh, political lines. Um, but what I see in our nation's capital troubles me. Um, I think it's important for us uh, to remember and for me to remind all of us that God is on the throne. Uh, he's in total control of our world and that uh, Jesus is still the answer uh, to humanity's needs. What is new for us, however, as Americans is uh, that we must come to grips with the uh, reality of the darkness that, our, uh, that has descended on our nation. <laughs> Gone are the days of uh, uh, Ozzy and Harriet and um, Father Knows Best. Our culture, our political leaders have uh, abandoned the moral values upon which we were founded as a country. God has been uh, banned from public discourse and is no longer valued. Um, and as a nation, we are realizing the consequences of those developments, those decisions. It seemed to me this past week, as I was reflecting on what I wanted to say today, that the counsel that comes from the author of Hebrews in chapter 10, we looked last week at chapter 1, but the counsel uh, that he gives his audience in chapter 10 uh, appears to be very practical wisdom for us in our day. He writes to them uh, and could just as well be writing to us, draw near to God. Now that was enabled or made available uh, by the coming of this baby Jesus whose birth we just celebrated. His life, his death on the cross, uh, allows us to draw near to God. Before that, there was a gulf between humanity and God. You could only approach him in very prescribed ways. And uh, if you violated that, uh, your life was in serious jeopardy. So now we can draw near to God as the author admonishes us. Secondly, he says that we should hold unswervingly to the hope that we profess. Our hope is in God and in Jesus. It's not in any other person or development or set of circumstances. Our hope is in Jesus. Thirdly, he says, consider how we may spur one another on to love and good deeds. And he follows that up with a fourth admi admonition saying, don't give up meeting together uh, so that we can encourage one another, being in worship, being in fellowship with other believers, which is exactly what we're trying to do in our congregation at the present time through a strategic planning uh, team, how we can uh, revitalize and energize our fellowship and our outreach into our community. It's up to every individual member, of course, uh, at what level and to uh, what area they're going to participate in. But there's no doubt that uh, America is not the country it was even a few years ago. Uh, 
and our decline has been um, significant uh, in the last year. So as a means of encouraging us, we looked into Scripture last Sunday uh, and asked the question, who is Jesus? Who is this baby whose birth we just celebrated? Well, my contention is that uh, God still speaks to us uh, in, in, in many times in various ways, but especially through Jesus and the Holy Spirit uh, and, uh, and his word, the Bible. According to the Bible record, Jesus is God in human form. And he is the exact representation of God's nature, as our author said last week. God is sovereign. He is in control of the evil that we see in our nation and our world. And he holds our universe totally together by the power of his word, his will. And his spirit, the Holy Spirit, still lives in us in order to instruct us, guide us, and empower us to live in a righteous way, a way that pleases God. But as we ended our uh, time together last Sunday, I posed a very difficult question. If God speaks to us, and I maintain that he does, and has provided it all the resources we need to live a righteous life before him, and he's provided that, He's given us his Holy Spirit to uh, instruct us, to guide us, to motivate us. How is it possible that our world, our nation particularly, is so filled with darkness and deceitfulness and corruption? Well, as I promised last week, we'll look at God's answer for that, and we find it in, God, in John's Gospel uh, in the first chapter. John gives us an, God's answer to that question, and we're going to get to that in just a moment. But in our text today, John affirms the words that we learned last week, or the truth that we learned last week, from the author of Hebrews. But, as with every author in the uh, scriptures, he does so in his unique way, and he adds some additional life-changing insights to his uh, gospel record. Last week, the author of the Hebrews began his um, sermon, that's what he's writing, or a white paper, um, but he began it with a time marker, or what we call a time marker. He wrote, in the past, God spoke through the prophets. Now, his time reference is that of the Old Testament, after creation and after the formation of the Hebrew people um, from Abraham and Sarah. His goal was to show the change in means uh, of God speaking to humanity. In the past, the prophets, and now, as he was writing, now to them meant the first century, but it would also uh, apply to us. He speaks through Jesus, the Holy Spirit, and uh, his word. But the author of the Hebrews' ultimate goal was to show the, his audience that Jesus, uh, even in their day and as it is in our day, is the only means by which to have a relationship with God, meaning that traditional Judaism is no longer effective. It doesn't... Uh, we do, they, Animal sacrifices, as the Old Testament Jews um, carried them out, do not work in, in covering our sins. Jesus' life and death, his blood on the cross, washes our sins away. So we come to John's Gospel in chapter 1, verse 1, and we see that he has a time marker also, but it is different. He writes, in the beginning was the word. Now, his time marker is both practical and theological. John is telling his audience, which included uh, Jews and Gentiles, uh, that Jesus is the pre-existent eternal Son of God. 
He comes to the same conclusions relative to Jesus as the author of Hebrews. He just comes at it from a different time marker. Because John is writing to a different audience than the author to Hebrews was. And that shows us something very significant about Scripture. When we understand the audience to whom the author is writing, and we understand who's writing and what we know about that author, we get to see Jesus, and I would put C in quotes, uh, in a different perspective. And that is that when we look, for instance, at the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, each of these writers write, is writing to a specific audience and is portraying uh, or presenting Jesus to that audience in a way they would relate to it. And when we look at it in the whole, we get a more complete and accurate view of who Jesus is. Now, we'll get to this concept a little bit more as we come to um, part two of our series. But getting back to John's gospel, in the first three verses, he parallels the truths that the author of Hebrews gave us last week. Again, he just comes at it with a different time marker. And that is that Jesus is God, that he has always existed uh, along with God the Father that uh, he existed actually before time, in the beginning was, past tense, um, the word. Um, but he lived before time. Why? Because he created time. And in fact, as uh, John says to us, that without him, nothing was made that has been made. Verse 3 of chapter 1. You know, this word, word, that John calls Jesus is a very interesting and unique uh, word or concept. It has very special meaning in the ancient world for both Jews and Greeks, and so John uses that word to communicate truth to both groups because his audience was the whole world, his known world then, whereas the other gospel writers are writing to a unique or specific audience. What's important for us to know about this Greek word, word, which is logos, L-O-G-O-S, is that it refers to a message, not just a word or a single word. God communicated uh, in a message, and that message is both a verbal and a person. God is communicating with all of humanity through his word, logos. Jesus. So everything that Jesus said, everything that he did, the way he said it, uh, the way he did it, uh, demonstrates for us that this is God speaking to us. Now in verses 4 and 5 of chapter 1 of John's gospel, we see John's presentation of Jesus in his unique way. And by the way, these two verses set the foundation or the background, perhaps, for God's answer to our question from last Sunday. John writes, in him, meaning Jesus, was life, and that life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, but the darkness did not understand it. Now, the Greek word there for life, zoe, just like the young lady's name, Z-O-E with a long E, refers to resurrected life, eternal life. If John were just speaking about human life in general, he would have used the word bios, like biology. And I want you to note in that verse that uh, this eternal life was for all of humanity. That life was the light of men. There are no exclusions all humanity, God sent Jesus as life and light to all humanity. But then John says the darkness did not understand it. Now, light in biblical language, and particularly with the apostle John, refers to truth, God's truth, and the knowledge 
of God. That brings life and life to humanity. Darkness, on the other hand, refers to an absence of truth and certainly a lack of knowledge or even acknowledgement of God. And thus, the word uh, darkness aptly describes <laughs> our nation today. And it certainly described the world into which Jesus was born, John's world, Palestine, that was dominated uh, uh, or occupied by uh, the Roman uh, Empire. Darkness is humanity's natural state. Right? Darkness is a result of sinfulness, a lack of knowledge of God, acknowledgement of God, and relationship with God. So John says the darkness has not understood it, meaning life and light. The, the eternal life that was found in Christ as the Logos, the messenger of God, or the message of God, was not understood nor comprehended. Now, the Greek word for not understood it has as a root meaning uh, to grasp, to grab, okay? And therefore, there's two possible uh, applications or uses. First, grasp would be as to grasp and overpower or grasp and understand and comprehend. Scholars have argued for centuries on which application or use of that word John intended. And I argue that John uh, intended both. He left it in, uh, intentionally ambiguous. You see, Westerners, um, modern scholars and scholars down through the ages, we think uh, in terms of either or, has to be one or the other. Whereas Easterners, Jews of the ancient world think in terms of both and. doesn't cause them any grief at all. And so he thinks of both overpower and a grasp as to comprehend or understand. Both meanings certainly describe our nation uh, today. Well, in verses 6 to 9, John pre presents us with a parenthesis the Apostle Paul is noted for his uh, parentheses. There great truth in these um, uh, distractions, if you will, or, or parentheses, uh, but it sometimes makes it a little hard to follow the logic, especially with the Apostle Paul. But here, John is simply talking about John the Baptist and his ministry of preparing that world for the coming of Jesus. And based on that foundation that John has provided prior to that, he now moves in verse 10 to answer our question that we have from last week. In verse 10, he writes, he, Jesus, was in the world. Yes, he came as a baby and grew to be a man. And though the world was made by him, he created all that there is, the world did not know him. John is using the Hebrew concept of the word know, which means or relates to knowing someone in terms of relationship. That's opposed to the Greek understanding of the word know, which is more of a mental uh, acknowledgement of the facts, an intellectual understanding to know. Now, in truth, both of those definitions or both of those applications are important to God. That's why he revealed himself to us. He gave us the facts so that we would know who he is and his nature. Um, and then he spoke to us uh, and still speaks to us through nature and the scriptures and Jesus and the Holy Spirit. And so both knows um, are valid. Uh, but here... Uh, John's goal, God's goal, is the Hebrew uh, connotation of the word know because he wants us to know him in terms of relationship. God created us for the sole purpose 
of having fellowship, having a relationship with us, with all of his creatures, including you and me, of course. So in verse 11, John goes on and he says, he came to his own and those who were his own did not receive him. Now, this is another ex uh, example of John's unique writing style and, and uh, skill uh, in writing, actually. The first, his own, is a word that refers to the entire creation, the, the entire world, everyone. But the second, his own, is a word that refers to a smaller group of people, uh, the Jewish people, Jesus was Jewish, and so he came to his own, his creations, all of his creatures that he created, and then he came to his own, the Jewish people, and neither received him. That's kind of the beauty of the ancient Koine Greek, the ancient world uh, Greek language. You can say so much with uh, a precise word or use of grammar. Uh, it was an excellent language. Uh, that we use today to understand scripture. But the point is that John says neither group uh, received him. And here is, uh, herein lies God's sad answer to our question of last Sunday. Again, his own, both uh, the world, all of creatures, and uh, the Jewish people made a conscious choice not to accept Jesus, not to accept God's message of life and light that came through Jesus. And that is why particularly our nation at this time in history is in such dire straits. We're in darkness because we have intentionally dismissed God. We've dismissed his son. We've dismissed the word of God, the Bible, and God's message that came through Jesus. You know, it struck me that the Apostle uh, Paul puts it best in his letter to the church in Rome. Romans chapter 1, verse 18. And you could read from 18 all the way to the end of that, that chapter. But I want to quote for you, um, or read for you just verse 18 of chapter 1. This is about the consequences of our choice uh, as a human, a human being. The wrath of God is being poured out, present tense. If you read that last week, is being poured out. If you read it in a year, it still is being poured out. It's continuing present action. The wrath of God is being poured out from heaven against all the godlessness and wickedness of humans who suppress the truth by their wickedness. Really a very dark uh, description of... Uh, Paul's day in uh, the Roman Empire, but very apt about our day in America in the 21st century. Well, let's look at verse 12, because uh, John takes a 180-degree turn and goes in an opposite direction. But, speaking of Jesus, to all who received him, to those who believed in his name, which means his identity and his message from God, he, meaning Jesus, gave the right to become children of God. Now, here's an answer to those who teach that everyone, every human being, is a child of God. The Bible doesn't teach that. We are all God's creation. But in order to become a child of God, John here is showing that we must make a conscious choice to put our faith in Jesus, to understand, to, to receive or accept him as God's message of life and light to us. And then, having accepted him, believing in his name, meaning his nature and his purpose, Jesus then gives us the right to be a child of God. So, who is Jesus? He's God's message of life, eternal life, and light, knowledge of God, relationship with God. And that comes through faith in him. Let's pray. 
Father God, we thank you for your gift of your son that we celebrate at Christmas. We thank you that he brought with him life, eternal life, and then light, that through him we get to know you and we get to have a relationship with you. Thank you for these truths and these writers that uh, presented them for us in your word, and we're, we just pray that you would apply it to our hearts. Um, change how we think, change how we live. In Jesus' name, amen. Have a good week.